Breaches and cybersecurity incidents are making headlines every day. What are you doing to be prepared? Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast, brought to you by Tripwire, the show that explores cybersecurity for the enterprise and how to identify and protect against cyber threats before they happen. Listen for techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. Now, here's your host, Tim Erlen. Welcome, everyone, to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. I am Tim Erlen, VP of Strategy at Tripwire. And today, I am joined by a couple of other Tripwire folks. I've got Raymond Kirk, a Technical Product Manager, and Brent Holder, Senior Technical Product Manager at Tripwire. And the topic we want to talk about today is cloud security. So cloud security is definitely a, a hot topic, um, one that uh, that shows up a lot these days. But as the technology for cloud has expanded, it's not always clear what people actually mean when they say cloud security. You might you might say it's an overloaded term. So I kind of want to start at that level uh, with what does the term cloud security actually encompass? And, and Brent, I'll, I'll start with you, I think. So from your perspective, what is cloud security when we talk about that term? What does it really mean? Um, I just, I think about the different answers that we get from different people when we're talking to them. Um, there's a lot of different ways that my mind goes with cloud security, but what's always interesting to me is uh, if you ask someone, you know, what they're dealing with in cloud security, if they are on, you know, like a development team but have security uh, priorities, cloud security is kind of focused on, I've got new developers that I'm hiring onto my team, and I need to make sure that the way that they're using their accounts is correct, uh, which doesn't necessarily have anything to do with, you know, the the templates that are being used for the virtual machines and the environment and all those things. They're, then you talk to the people in IT, and they're like, I want to make sure that we're using, you know, the, the approved uh, <laughs> virtual machine templates and uh, you talk to someone on the security team and they say, you know, we want to make sure that when someone works their way around our policy, we can find out because they might not report it. Um, so it, it's kind of this, uh, this puzzle that it seems like a lot of different people are holding individual pieces of. And if everyone held up their pieces together, you might be able to see the whole picture of it, but kind of depending on which part of the organization someone's in, their concept of cloud security is going to be uh, pretty tightly crafted to you know their area of expertise or concern. I think. Yeah, it reminds me a little bit of the the I don't know what you would call it the old adage about a, an elephant and you know different people feeling different parts of the elephant and describing it very differently and none of them can see the whole picture. They all have very focused approaches. Ray, Raymond, what about you? What would you what would you add there that that uh, Brent maybe didn't cover that's that's included in that broad term cloud security. Yeah, you know, um, so when people think about cloud security, we I, I tend to see that they start thinking about IaaS, our infrastructure as a service. Um, but there there's a wider landscape than that, such as uh, platform as a service, and then also uh, SaaS, so uh, software as a service. So I think cloud security uh, pretty much encompasses. Anywhere your data is living, your business critical data is living outside of your own data center. Well, so I, I think we have to tie it to, to a little bit of the, the technology evolution. Um, Brent, you mentioned a couple of technology uh, terms in there. But if we just sort of take a step back and talk about, you know, what, what was cloud, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, and, and what is it today? Like, what are the technologies involved? Um, I, you know, Brent, do you want to just uh, what comes to mind for you when you think of that evolution of of how cloud has has grown as a, a set of technologies? Right. That just kind of like brought to mind the, the CI CD pipeline, because I think like when when someone <clears throat> has had hands on the CI CD pipeline has changed over the years, like uh, the you know, it's been kind of a developer centric thing early on. Um, and then it's been slowly, you know, you get more and more stakeholders trying to, uh, to automate or do, uh, what they're concerned with, um, as code early on in the process. Um, you know, at, you know, Black Hat 2019, there's a ton of different people whose talks were all about, you know, DevSecOps is a thing. We need to involve security and DevOps. Um, or you're going to have these kind of like 
warring groups. Um, so when I, I think about like spinning up containers uh, to do some job for a company, uh, you have this automated process that originally just made the work happen, um, and then it needed to make the work happen with following certain policies. So you start to get a little bit of like compliance or IT involvement, and then uh, you get the, and it needs to follow these security practices, and we're sort of codifying that. So uh, when I think of like cloud advancement, I think of uh, who got on the bus to shift left first. Mm. <laughs> well, more so more there's people. an interesting question in there for me, which is, uh, and I, you know, I don't, I don't know exactly the sequence of events here, but just the concept of CI/CD, continuous integration, continuous deployment, uh, did that. Did that concept predate cloud? Like, did we have organizations doing effectively DevOps type integration without deploying it to cloud? Or was it a, a, a practice that, that came with cloud deployments? I think that this is, uh, anytime you talk about cloud, you're going to end up in the hybrid zone. Mm. And I think this is one of those things. I think there are people who have, um, you know, unique to their company, totally valid reasons that they absolutely positively have to keep everything on prem. And then you have the people who are born in the cloud, uh, you know, use these technologies to race for advancement um, that are just all in on the cloud. And then there's the whole spectrum in between. Um, because of the kind of timeline of this, there were probably, you know, as the whole concept of continuous integration, continuous deployment came out, there's probably at least some people who were doing it very cloud centric and some who were doing it very much on prem. Mm -hmm. Um, I I don't know that, uh, I I think that the, they kind of tie together though, in terms of, uh, the purpose the efficiency gain from moving things to the cloud, um, and why people kind of move workloads to the cloud to begin with, uh, it's the same kind of mentality as why people would do continuous integration, continuous deployment. Yeah, it's interesting because the more that we we talk about cloud and cloud technology and the way it's evolved, that the more it becomes not a separate thing from you know the on premise capabilities that that organizations have. And and this, I, I can't remember the exact words you used there, but you said you know at this point it's all hybrid. Um, more and more, cloud security has to address on-premise use cases as much as it does deployment in the cloud because the the because of the hybrid nature of, of most enterprises it seems yeah and I think that kind of comes back to the the who are you talking to part of it unfortunately I think a lot of times there are people whose kind of area of expertise or focus um, might have them you know sure we're in the cloud and we have some stuff on-prem but I'm the on-prem data center windows person so, yes, somewhere in our organization, someone has to care about cloud, but that's not me right now. And if you ask that person who's, you know, been in the midst of moving workloads to the cloud for the last five years for that company, um, they would have a totally different perspective as well. So mm-hmm. while, like, on a whole, if you zoom out, you can see, you know, it's all hybrid, um, it tends to be, you, know, you rarely see a situation where someone's like, I have a full personal grasp of our on-prem infrastructure and its security needs and our cloud infrastructure and that yeah. those sets of security needs. Yeah, I mean I, that's that's an interesting way to look at it. You know, if we if we think about that whole elephant thing, you know, Raymond, d- does does anybody these days actually have the ability to see the whole elephant from a cloud security perspective or is it just really a collection of individuals with specified expertise? Well, I, I think that's the challenge that you know, so many organizations are looking to um, overcome is getting that single pane of glass on, you know, what do I have? What's out there? And what state is it in? So um, whether or not that problem has been solved completely, I think that's still up for grabs because there's so many new technologies that are coming into play. I think there's a uh, study out that says like the average companies using somewhere close to 300 different SaaS applications. So the landscape's ever growing. Well, and that that brings up a, a an important point I think, which is as we as we talk about this this big bucket of things we call cloud security, there are some areas where 
organizations on the whole, I mean, there's a spectrum of, of capability, of course, some organizations on a whole have reasonably good visibility. For example, I think, you know, if you're deploying virtual images as workloads, chances are, you know, you've got a set of security tools that you can purchase and implement that are going to give you pretty good visibility of the security state of those workloads at this point. Um, but I, I want to touch on the things that that are are the blind spots, right? So if I'm one of those folks who has a, a view of part of that elephant, what am I missing? Like as an organization, what are the likely blind spots around people should be more aware of? Uh, yeah, Raymond, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think oftentimes it uh, a lot of the focus is on you know our workloads, right? Where we're where are we launching our production applications and making sure those things are secure. But I often like to remind people about some of the other SaaS and business uh, critical systems that are out there that your organization may be using that you may not have that visibility to, like such as HR tools, um, sales tools, such as Salesforce. There, there's things out there that also um, contain really sensitive, important information to the business that the average IT security person may not necessarily um, consider as cloud security. Yeah, there's an interesting mental exercise you could go through there, or or a you know a on paper exercise if you if you wanted of looking at your your inventory of of SaaS uh, tools that you use considering the the data that they store and then asking yourself what what security controls would you put in place for that data in a data center and then are you applying those same controls to that SaaS offering and and why not if you're not because the 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 data sensitivity or the type of data is often sort of that key driver for the the level of of you know the security controls you have to apply You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. Why? Because we detect suspicious activity before it becomes breach. Our systems work on-site and in the cloud to find, monitor, and minimize a wide range of threats. With deep system visibility and automated compliance, we help you shorten the time it takes to catch vulnerabilities and ensure your organization is following the absolute best practices in cybersecurity today. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. Ray, you, you know, you sort of pointed out SaaS as a good example of a blind spot, right? You have organizations that adopt SaaS tools, but don't necessarily have the ability or the, the visibility into to secure them. Uh, Brent, what what are some other blind spots that, that you've seen or that come to mind for you for cloud security? Um, I, I was thinking of some other things, but I just want to kind of uh, plus one to what Raymond was saying, because to tie it back to the CI, CD thing, some of these tools, like Raymond mentioned Salesforce, can be actually part of the work being done. You know, data can be moved from or to Salesforce as part of an automated process. So to literally do the work, some of these SaaS tools are being used. Uh, They're part of the same chain. You know, everyone's all tied in together. So that visibility kind of takes on a little extra (laughs) importance when you've, uh, you know, bought all the different integrators and modules that tie it all together and make it do the work. Um, But I think that uh, one of the, the biggest pauses that I hear in user interviews is uh, when we ask people, you know, are you using cloud security? And most people would say yes, and they are, you know, it's not technically untrue. uh, But what they're saying is, you know, we switched on the thing, the service that we consider security in our provider's options. Um, And then it's like, okay, so you switched on that service. Uh, How do you know that it's working or how do you judge its effectiveness? And then there's a long pause. Can I can so, I jump in so, there? Yeah, please go ahead, Ray. Yeah, so I mean, th- just turning on the feature or the security is one piece of it. But I, I think we've all heard, uh, hopefully we have by now, about, about the shared responsibility model. Um, I, I think it's important to remember that, like, there's other things outside of your infrastructure as service um, tools that 
actually have a shared responsibility model, just sort of kind of piggybacking off the theme here is Salesforce. Like Salesforce, they actually, um, they, they find vulnerabilities, they push out updates, but it's actually up to the Salesforce admins to manually activate those updates. So the, the, there's not a one button click all and I can forget about it in these um, SaaS environments. Mm. That's an interesting, uh, there are a couple of interesting things in there. So, so first of all, the shared responsibility model, I, I, I guarantee you there are folks who haven't heard of it. Um, I think that, you know, the point there is that, uh, I think that's a term, correct me if I'm wrong, that's a term that sort of started with AWS and they, they came out a while back with a pretty clear, crystal clear declaration of here are the things we're responsible for securing. And then here are all the things that you as a customer are still responsible for securing. And I would kind of summarize that as they'll take care of their own infrastructure but you're responsible for your own data, your own applications, the things and workloads that you run in AWS. Um, and so customers who uh, believe that somehow AWS or whoever the provider is, is going to magically secure all their 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 data and their workloads, is they're going to be greatly disappointed. Um, so I think it's important to clarify what that means. Um, but it's interesting because I hadn't thought of that example as extending to SaaS, where you still have that need for a shared responsibility model. Um, so that's a, a an interesting perspective as well. Yeah, 100%. Like, e- even with Zoom, like, there, there's configurations within Zoom that, you know, um, could potentially be risky if there's not an admin to make sure that configurations to the cuff, uh, the user or the organization's um, specification are enabled, such as making sure that recorded meetings are not set as private. Some of the same things that you would see in like an AWS environment where making sure your S3 buckets are secure, there's some of those same controls in some of these third-party SaaS or um, I guess sanctioned SaaS applications that organizations are using. Yeah. You point out an interesting kind of contradiction there that you know, in a lot of ways, people have flocked to cloud providers, whether whether SaaS or infrastructure or platform, um, because those providers will take care of more of the the administration of the 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 backend infrastructure. But at the same time, if customers request flexibility in terms of configuration or in terms of updates, so for example, I don't want Salesforce to automatically push updates to me. I'm creating that same administrative burden that I, I I was trying to get away from, and I'm adding complexity. And we all know that that complexity has a tendency to lead towards the at least the potential for misconfigurations that have a, a security implication. Interesting, yeah, yeah. I hadn't really thought too much about that 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 security. You know, requiring someone who uses a SaaS to apply the update themselves, it, it's a bit backwards from a, a SaaS perspective, and and creates potential security risk where the SaaS provider has now transferred that risk to the, the customer as well. Yeah, there, there's also the idea of like with any uh, compliance, like with any uh, compliance framework, you may get into a situation the the user, here is the best practice, here's what you should be doing. Um, and you can kind of pass or fail against whether or not you're doing that. But in some scenarios, like we know we're going to fail at this because we're doing something for a specific reason. And so you have to kind of like wave things. And I think that the it's sort of the inverse of these security uh, services or tools that are enabled by cloud service providers or SaaS providers. Um, they give you the tools to do certain things, but they're also giving you the flexibility uh, to do things your way. And I think a lot of people mistake a service as a managed service. You know, uh, there isn't someone sitting watching on the other end to make sure you're doing everything uh, as securely as humanly possible. They're giving you the flexibility you need to, you know, use their solution to solve your problem and that includes letting you do things uh in a way that if that you're not careful about it um could make a mm-hmm. meeting that was supposed to be private available mm-hmm. to be watched by somebody out there or otherwise uh sure. able to yeah, compromise. Yeah. So what are, are there other blind spots that we should talk about? There's definitely one that's uh top of mind <laughs> for me lately which is um people are, are having uh, similar to the translating the concerns of infrastructure to software as a service, there's the translating the concerns of uh, more traditional infrastructure like physical and virtual servers to containers. Um, they're it's still part of your infrastructure. They're still handling 
parts of the workloads that may be, um, you know, under the purview of your uh, compliance, like PCI, things like that? And how do you do the same work to ensure the uh, that those workloads are compliant mm-hmm. or secure for containers? It gets real muddy. And um, one of the, the ones that pops up a lot is people talking about trying to monitor the, you know, the files themselves, FIM for containers, basically. That's one that uh, comes up yeah. again and again. Well, well, but aren't these containers supposed to be immutable? I mean, isn't that like the idea of containers? You, you create the right configuration up front, then you deploy these immutable containers that are, are uh, nobody can change. Yeah, and we know that everyone does it you know, perfectly and following best practices. Yeah. But, I, uh, I had to ask that a little um, bit tongue-in-cheek I, I already know the answer. Yeah. The, so uh, even though it's best practice to have the root file system of the container itself immutable, uh, you still have to have state change, right? Like there need to be files that you know, an image needs to change for your website or whatever, and you don't necessarily want to spin up a whole fleet of containers just to make these little changes like that. So that's where volumes come in. Um, and so having state change in a workload being handled by containers isn't inherently bad, but how much of that can you see? How much of it can you say, this was an intended change and this wasn't? Um, it's, a, it's a pretty murky terrain right now. And there's also a lot of people, for totally valid reasons, that uh, are spinning something up as a container, that they're having state change inside the container itself still. Um, sure, in a perfect world, we could say, this is the container's root file system, so it is read-only, there's nothing you can do about that, and then uh, we'll just use special volumes for the parts that need to change. But um, there's you know totally valid use cases out there where People say, well, I have this whole thing spin up as a container, and there are changes that happen inside it, and that's the way it needs to work. So we're not just going to leave them out in the cold, you know, for using a, a totally vi- uh, viable uh, Yeah, it reminds technology. me. I mean, it's kind of like the, the lift and shift approach to um, cloud in general, you know, where as an organization, you move towards containers, you build all of your, your new applications in a, in a really forward-thinking way, a current way. But you've got legacy applications that you don't want to manage completely separately. So you move them into containers, but you don't really update them. And they end up being like, you know, essentially persistent servers that run as containers. And that it's a, a, a valid way to do it in that circumstance, but presents a, a number of risks that you then have to manage, of course. Yeah, absolutely. It, it gets really interesting when you talk about the age of containers, um, because in even some of those... Uh, companies, you may have the average age of a container just by number is very, very short, but then you still have a a, a sizable number that, you know, are going to be running for days, weeks, months. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. We've talked a lot about sort of the cloud technology and, and some of the security implications, some of the blind spots. But what we haven't touched upon yet is really, uh, you know, some of the threat landscape and the risks that that cause us to worry about cloud security. So um, what's top of mind in terms of, of risks uh, related to any of the, the cloud technologies that we've talked about so far? I'd have to say um, just with the year being 2021 um, ransomware, right, we've we've we saw that in the news a lot, um, but I, I think there's ransomware, there's data breaching, um, leaking sensitive information. Then there's the whole um, crypto jacking and, and the rise of that going on as well. well. Well, let's talk about crypto jacking for a second, because I think the the others, you know, we, we're more familiar with from their in some ways, translations of, of attacks that we see on-premise to, you know, a new uh, attack surface, right? Ransomware isn't, isn't sort of a, a new thing um, in that sense, although it's certainly still popular. But, but crypto jacking seems like something that, that um, is a little bit more cloud-specific. So, uh, Raymond, can you just tell, talk a little bit about what crypto jacking is and why it's a concern? Definitely, definitely. So crypto jacking is when some bad actor out there um, gains unauthorized access to your cloud infrastructure and resources and somehow 
uses that access to launch some type of software that enables them to mine for crypto coins, which is effectively um, making them money, but costing the organization money as well by using their resources. They're pretty sophisticated. They typically uh, try to make sure that they don't raise any alarms. So you've mm. got people with like system admin backgrounds that know what a system is supposed to look like. And they make sure that while they're doing this crypto mining and crypto jacking uh, unbeknownst to you know the organization, that things look relatively normal. Yeah, I think that uh, crypto jacking is sort of like, it reminds me of um, when people would get the video game Doom to play on some new piece of technology <laughs> that you wouldn't expect. It <laughs> seems like that's the new challenge. Like, can you get your crypto miner to run yeah. on this? Like, uh, you know, they, they drop the software right into a writable S3 bucket or uh, they like replace the, the base image name in a container definition. So... The container does otherwise everything you expect it to, but now plus uh, goes into production with this added bonus of yeah. mining. Yeah, and, and the end result there is that that I mean, if they're successful at it, you don't see anything materially change in your environment except your bill goes up, and you're effectively transferring, you know, the money you're paying for your bill, uh, whether it's AWS or Azure or whatever, to crypto coin for them. Um, they're using your resources to generate money for themselves. It's 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 much more efficient than having to ask you for ransom, I suppose. Yeah, you don't have to agree to what's being actively stolen true. from under you. I suppose it kind of reminds me of uh, just the the make, making it hard to see. Um, that's kind of like the whole portion of the miter attack framework of um, you know, mm -hmm. evasion techniques. Uh, so I, I was kind of looking into. MITRE ATT&CK framework versus the CIS and realizing it's kind of like MITRE ATT&CK is the red team view and CIS is the blue team view, but they're kind of trying to yeah, solve at the same true. problem. That's a good analogy. It's a good way to think about it. And I think that, uh, you know, for, for all of these technologies that are out there now and the spread of them and the, the hyper-specific job that they'll sometimes do, um, it's all kind of meant to give you either that red or blue team view of what is or isn't going wrong in your environment and uh if you start to be able to catch these little defense evasion techniques uh, or catch these moments of unexpected processes running things like that um that's where uh you can you can save yourself <laughs> whatever hasn't mm -hmm. already been mined um save yourself that amount of mm -hmm. money and time excellent all right well we are out of time for this conversation um i want to thank you brent and uh raymond both of you for joining me i think it was really interesting covered some interesting topics and uh, hopefully provided a little bit more clarity and possibly a little bit more confusion around cloud security and, and what it means. Um, and for everybody listening, I hope it was interesting and educational for you and uh, that you'll tune in for the next episode of the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thanks. You have been listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Join us next time as we explore stories of people protecting people and techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. We'll talk to you next time on the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast.